The Last Princess The Story of Princess Kaiulani of Hawaii by Faye Stanley Illustrated by Diane Stanley The Last Princess The Story of Princess Kaiulani of Hawaii by Faye Stanley Illustrated by Diane Stanley For my daughter, again, FSG For my mother, again DS. The Hawaiian Islands. Hawaii is made up of a chain of 132 islands, with eight main islands in the southeastern end of the chain. The island of Hawaii gives its name to the entire group. Ni'ihau Island, Kauai Island, Oahu Island, Molokai Island, Lanai Island, Maui Island, Kaho Ohalawe Island, and Hawaii Island. The life of Princess Kaiulani of Hawaii began like the happiest of fairy tales. She was the only child of the beautiful princess Miriam Likelike and her we wealthy, handsome husband, Archibald Cleghorn. And she was the first, born ch first child born to the royal family, for her uncle, King Kalakahua, had no children of his own. From the day of her birth on October 16, 1875, Princess Kaulani seemed destined to become queen of this ancient island kingdom. At the news of her birth, all of Hawaii rejoiced. Bells rang joyously from church towers. Cannons fired noisy salutes. Hawaiians hugged one another and wept with happiness. An heir to the Hawaiian throne had at last been born. The precious baby was christened on Christmas Day. Her mother, Princess Likelike, chose a name for her that was almost bigger than the tiny infant herself. As the priest sprinkled holy water on her doll-sized head, he baptized her Princess Victoria Kaiulani Kalani Nuiya Hili Lapalapala Kawei Kui I Luna Lilo. The name Kaiulani means the royal sacred one. Artist imagined portrait of the royal family at the time of Princess Kaiulani's christening. Front row, left to right. Queen Kapiolani, her husband, King David. Kalakua, his sisters, Princess, later Queen, Lili Uokalani, and Princess Miriam Likelike Cleghorn, and held by her mother, Princess Victoria Kaiulani. Back row, left to right, Princess Ruth K. Ilikiokalani, Governor of the Island of Hawaii, and Kaulani's godmother, Husband of Princess Liliuokalani, John Owen Dominus, Governor of the Island of Oahu, Princess Like Like's husband, and father of the Princess Kaiulani, the Honorable Archibald Cleghorn, later Governor of Oahu. The baby's aunt, Princess Ruth, who had a great and generous heart, was named one of her godmothers. As the christening present, she gave little Kaiulani ten acres of land on Waikiki. This beach on the island of Oahu was one of the meeting ground of the Hawaii's warrior chiefs. There, the princess's father built his family a fine new house. He called it Aina Hau, which means the cool place, because of the fresh breezes that blew down from the mountains. Around the house, he created the loveliest garden, in all that beautiful island. Archibald Cleghorn was from Scotland. Though he was a commoner, not a member of a royal family like his wife, he was, wise, he was a wise friend and advisor to King Kalakau, a successful importer. He was also an expert in the art of growing plants and flowers. At Ainahau, he planted sweeping emerald lawns bordered by royal palm trees. In front of the house stood a majestic banyan tree, 
which became a favorite play place for little Kaulani. He imported spice trees from India with scented bark that perfumed the air, and ate, ver ate varieties of mango trees to provide delicious mango chutney for the princess's table. Then he added bright blooming hibiscus and dense thickets of trees with exotic names like monkey pod, ironwood, camphor, buttercup, and breadfruit. Every day, Kaiulani played there with her giant turtle and, and hand-fed the peacocks that strutted across the green lawns. She often rode her white pony, Fairy, over the beautiful grounds or went surfing or swimming off Waikiki. Another child might have been spoiled growing up at Ayanahau. But the princess was a sweet-natured, merry child, adored by family and servants alike. When she was older, she began lessons in the cool, dark house with her governess. Kaiulani did well in her studies, and she was said to be as bright as she was beautiful. It was not until she was eleven and her mother suddenly became ill that the first dark shadows slanted across the little princess's life. During Christmas of 1886, Princess Like Like was not her usual lively self. She grew quiet. Then one day she suddenly refused to eat anything at all and took to her bed. Like Like was clearly dying. Although she seemed to have no known illness and her husband brought one doctor after another, the princess grew weaker and weaker. In February of 1887, at the very end of her life, Like Like sent for little Ka Yulani. Those who were there said that the room was darkened and a faint smell of medicine hung in the air. Princess Like Like seemed to be sleeping, but as Kaiulani approached, her eyes opened and she stretched out a pale hand to her only child. Then, with a voice so low that Kaiulani could scarcely hear her, she whispered that for a moment she had been allowed to see into the future. She paused for breath and then told the child what she had seen. You will go far away from your land and your people and be gone a very long time. You will never marry, and you will never rule Hawaii. Later that afternoon, Princess Like Like died, and Princess Kaiulani's storybook childhood came to an end. But despite her sorrow, she was brave and self-controlled, and she went on with her studies and royal duties. As an alii, a noble from the reserved ruling family, she had been taught to set a good example for her people. Kaiulani was now the next heir to the throne, after her aunt Liliuokalani. When she was fourteen, the king and queen and her father decided that she should be sent across two wide oceans, the familiar Pacific and the forbidding Atlantic, to a boarding school in England. There she could receive an education fit for a future queen. At the thought of leaving her father, her friends, and her beloved Hawaii, Kaiulani was very grave. Though she tried to hide her feelings, she had a new friend who sensed the sadness in her heart. He was an enormously tall Scotsman, ridiculously thin, with dark, watchful eyes. His name was Robert Louis Stevenson, the author of Treasure Island, Kidnapped, and other great stories for children. Stevenson was spending a few weeks in Hawaii, and had become friends with all the royal family, but especially with the little princess. He described her as a more beautiful than the fairest flower. He would sit with her under her, under her gnarled banyan tree and spin tales of his travels, or tell her stories about the little mouse who visited him in the grass, work shack whenever he played his flute. When the time for Kaiulani's departure grew near, Stevenson wrote a special poem for her in her red plush autograph book, it began, Forth from her land to mine she goes, The island maid, the island rose, Light of heart and bright of face, The daughter of a double race. Her islands here in southern sun Shall mourn their Kaiulani gone, And I, in her dear Banyan shade, Look vainly for my little maid. In May of 1889, 
Kaiulani boarded the SS Omatia to leave Hawaii for the first time. As the ship left Honolulu Harbor, the band began to play the national anthem, Hawaii Pon Oi. Sadly, Kaulani waved goodbye to the crowds that came to see her off, then continued to wave and wave until the last tiny speck of green disappeared from sight. The voyage across the Pacific Ocean was rough, and Kaiulani was seasick most of the time. As the princess's ship neared San Francisco, the weather grew colder. She had never felt cold before, and was chilly even bundled up in heavy clothes. But worse than the cold was having to say goodbye to her papa in San Francisco. Here she boarded a train with friends for the long journey across America. Kaiulani was awestruck at the size of the country, and when she finally reached New York, she was dazzled by the tall buildings and the throngs of people in carriages in the streets. In New York, she boarded another ship to cross the Atlantic Ocean, where she was miserably seasick again, all the way to far-off London, England. In September, Kaiulani left London for her school, Great Harrowden Hall. This elegant 300-year-old mansion was now a private school for the daughters of rich and royal families. The princess met with many new things there, the cold, the discipline, all the other girls, and the classes themselves, for she had never been to a real school before. Despite all the strangeness and her lingering homesickness, Kaiulani soon made many friends and she enjoyed her classes. She studied French, German, English, history, music, and the social graces that she would need when she became queen. During school holidays, she traveled in England and Europe. She attended balls and parties in London and house parties at great estates in the English countryside, and she frequently visited her guardian, Theo H. Davies, a family friend who lived in England and looked after the princess when she was there. Her letters from this period are happy and carefree. They show her interest in ordinary things that affected ordinary girls of her time. She wrote of problems with German verbs and of having to wear spectacles for her nearsightedness. She chattered on about clothes and friends and flirtatious and of exciting plans being made to have her presented to Queen Victoria at court in the spring. But from time to time in letters arriving from Hawaii, Kaiulani came to learn about more serious things. From friends and family, she heard more and more about polit politics and problems at home. Even though Hawaiian islands looked like tiny specks on a map, they were important to other countries because they were located right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. What a perfect place for ships to get fresh water, fuel, and supplies when traveling to the Orient. What an ideal spot for traders to swap Oriental goods for American and European products. What a handy place for a military base. And what fertile land for raising rich crops to sell cheaply to other parts of the world. For all these reasons, the governments of Britain, France, Russia, and the United States had for years battled with one another to take over the islands, either by force or by trying to influence her kings to do whatever they wished. By the time Kaiulani was in England, a certain group of successful businessmen was really running the government. These Haoli, Hawaiian for foreigner, men were mostly white Americans. Many of them were sons of the missionaries who had come in the early 1800s to bring Christianity to Hawaii. The missionary families generally felt superior to the Hawaiians. They were openly scornful of their religion. They couldn't recognize the intelligence of a people whose culture was so different from their own. They called the Hawaiians savages, and because these families thought themselves so much better than the Hawaiians, they believed they were doing them a favor by telling their kings what laws to pass and dictating who could vote and who could not. Over the years, this group of Americans had grown rich and strong. By marrying into noble Hawaiian families and by tricking innocent farmers out of their land, they owned vast ranches and sugarcane plantations. Some became wealthy merchants and traders, 
and so gained control of shipping, banking, and politics. The Haoli's had become so powerful that in 1887 they had forced Kaiulani's king, uncle, King Kalakaua, to accept a new constitution that took away some of his ruling powers and said only some of his pe people could vote. Although the Haoli's, who were not even citizens, could vote, most of the Hawaiians could not because they were poor and without property. In letters from home, Kaiulani now heard that the Haoli's wanted to annex Hawaii to the United States, which meant that America would completely take over her country. This was upsetting, but it did not prepare her for a shocking message she received in October of 1890 from her uncle, the king. At the end of an otherwise normal letter, she read a chilling sentence warning her to be on guard against certain enemies I do not feel free to name in writing. Puzzled and frightened, Kaiulani wrote back asking the king to speak more clearly, but there was no reply. Two months later, she received a cable saying that he was dead. Suddenly, Kaiulani's aunt, Liliu, was queen, and Kaiulani herself was next in line for the throne. Aunt Liliu was in many ways stronger, was a stronger ruler than her brother had been. Since the Haoli's could not control her, they decided to overthrow her instead. On January 16, 1893, a company of American mar Marines marched into Honolulu. This show of force was all that was needed. The sight of the Marines encamped near the Iulani Palace convinced Liliuokalani that she must give up the throne as the Haoli's demanded. It was two weeks before Kaiulani learned of the revolution. Friends said later that she never fully recovered from the blow, but her kindly guardian suggested that there might still be a way to save her kingdom. She must go at once to Washington and personally speak with the new president, Grover Cleveland. Only he could block the planned annexation of Hawaii. Kaiulani was dismayed at the suggestion. She was only a timid 17-year-old, how could she presume to single-handedly oppose the powerful Haoli's or influence the president of one of the greatest nations on earth? But in spite of her terror, her love for her country and her people made her reconsider. Perhaps some day the Hawaiians will say, Kaiulani, you could have saved us and you did not try, she told her guardian. I will go with you. Once she had decided her course, Kaiulani did not waver from it. Before leaving England in February, she spoke of her cause to a newspaper reporter and won their hearts completely. A few weeks later, when she and her guardian docked in New York, she conquered the American press too. The reporters wrote about her delicate beauty, her talent for music, art, and languages, and her manners, those of a born aristocrat, and when she read her short prepared statement, Many had tears in their eyes. In a quiet voice, she told the reporters how it felt to arrive alone upon the shores where she thought to receive a royal welcome, to find enemies working to take away her kingdom, to leave her without a home or a name or a nation. She finished by saying, Today, I, a poor, weak girl, with not one of my people near me, and all these statesmen against me, have strength to stand up for the rights of my people. Even now, I can hear their wail in my heart, and it gives me strength and courage. When Kaiulani finally arrived in Washington, President and Mrs. Cleveland were deeply impressed by her courage and dignity. The President assured the Princess that he would see justice done to her and her people, he announced that a special investigator would sail to Hawaii immediately to report on the true situation there. This was the happiest news Kaiulani had received since the revolution. Believing she had successfully accomplished her mission, she felt free to return to England. But after the hectic month in the United States, it was hard for Kaiulani to settle back to her schoolgirl routine. She waited anxiously for news from home. 
It finally came in August. The president's representative was back from Hawaii and had reported to the Senate that a wrong had been done to the Hawaiians who were overwhelmingly opposed to annexation. The president then urged that Congress find a way to restore the queen to her throne. It seemed to Kaiulani that she had won. She, a poor weak girl, had helped save her aunt's throne and her people's independence. But her joy and triumph at the good news was short-lived. The Howleys refused to disband their new government, and the president was unwilling to send American troops to force the Howleys to step down. The only way to help he could give to the Hawaiians was to block their country's annexation as long as he was president. A group of outraged and disappointed young Hawaiians decided to take matters into their own hands. If the United States government could not restore their queen, they would do it themselves, by force. For months, these fiery young men planned their revolt. They secretly shipped in guns from California, which they buried on the beach at night. On the evening of January 6th, 1895, they gathered together and prepared to storm Honolulu the next day. But because a spy in their group told the authorities about the plan, and because the young men were poorly trained and armed, they were quickly put down. About 200 Hawaiians were arrested, and among them many friends and relatives of Kaiulani's. To save their lives of the revolutionaries, the Queen Arrain agreed to sign a document in which she formally gave up the throne. But the queen's punishment was not complete. She was also imprisoned in her own palace, tried for treason, and given a sentence of five years at hard labor plus a fine of $5,000. Later, this savage sentence was lightened, but the monarchy was finished. Hawaiian kings and queens would never again rule over their beloved people. In these last years, many Hawaiians had been robbed of their land and their right to vote and now they had lost their own government. They were now a minority in their own country, outnumbered by immigrants from the Orient and the Haoles. White man's diseases had caused the death of many of these independent, good-hearted people. At the bitter news from Hawaii, Kaiulani put aside her own dismay and grief and thought of her people. She knew in her heart that her place was now at home. When Kaiulani's ship arrived in Hawaii on November 9, 1897, the biggest crowd ever assembled at the Honolulu docks was there to greet her. Through tears, she received them abroad aboard ship and then let herself be driven through an Oahu she scarcely recognized. Everything looked different. The people were downcast and ragged. Aiolani Palace seemed tiny after the great palaces of Europe. At Ainahau, the vegetation was so dense that she scarcely recognized the estate, and the new mansion her father had built for her in her absence was so grand and unfamiliar that she could not feel at home in it. But Kaiulani would not let herself dwell on used-to-be's or might-have-been's. She was there to help her people. In the months after her return, she tried to do all that was expected of her. She kept her poise and dignity, but refused to be drawn into politics, setting an example to all Hawaiians during this time of heartbreaking change. After President Cleveland left office in 1897, Congress voted to annex Hawaii to the United States. The formal annexation day came on August 12, 1898. At Iolani Palace, the band played Hawaii Ponoi for the last time, and the Hawaiian flag fluttered to the ground. But Kaiulani was not there to witness it, nor were most of her people. The islands were in mourning. Houses were shuttered across the land. Kaiulani sat alone under her banyan tree, she heard the guns from warships in the harbor boom out and knew Hawaii's time as an independent nation was over. It was said that she was quietly weeping. During the following months, Kaiulani avoided Honolulu, 
hating the sight of the American troops everywhere and the sad faces of the Hawaiians. In December, glad to be away, she attended the wedding of her friend Ava Parker at the fabled Parker Ranch on the Hawa island of Hawaii. The wedding party was so large that it overflowed several houses and so gay that it lasted past Christmas. In mid-January, while horseback riding with friends, the princess was caught in an icy downpour. All the others pulled on raincoats, but Kaiulani suddenly swept off her hat, shook her hair loose from its neat bun, and turned her face to the storm, and recklessly galloped off in the driving rain. The next morning she was feverish, and every day afterward she grew worse. Kaiulani's father arrived to take her home to Ayanahau, where she lay ill for weeks. The doctors called her illness inflammatory rheumatism, but some thought her real disease was despair. Kaiulani drifted in and out of consciousness. Sometimes she opened her eyes and smiled at her friends and family gathered around her bed. Early in the morning of Monday, March 6, 1899, she stirred, cried out, and then grew still. Witnesses said that at the moment she drew her last breath, her peacocks in the darkness outside began wildly screaming their almost human cry. Hawaii was plunged into mourning. All day Wednesday, thousands of weeping Hawaiians filed past Kaiulani's casket at Ayanahau, then clustered together under the banyan tree, wailing ancient Hawaiian funeral chants. Even more of her people marched in the torchlit procession that took her body to Kawaiahi o church at the midnight. They spoke in whispers and even muffled their hooves of their horses pulling in the hearse. For over three days, Kaiulani lay in a state at Kawaiaha o church. Following her huge and beautiful funeral on Sunday, she was at last taken to the royal mausoleum in the new new nuanu valley bells pealed and cannons roared just as they had when kaiulani was born twenty thousand silent and stricken hawaiians watched as kaiulani passed by for the last time After only 23 years, Princess Kaiulani's role in Hawaii's history was over. As Like Like had foretold, she had traveled far and had long and been long away from her people. Although many young men had adored her, she had never married. And finally, she had never been queen. Or had she? She spent tireless years in exile and studied to, studied to fit herself for royal duties. She fought bravely in Washington to preserve the freedom of her people. She endured loss and sorrow with noble dignity. Perhaps the last princess of the little Hawaiian kingdom was indeed a queen. Pow. Finished.